Welcome everyone. My name is Jade Silva. I'm a coordinator senior in the Ira A. Fulton Schools of Engineering. I'm so happy to have all of you here with us. This is a great partnership with our Women Empowerment Series, which we kicked off last year in the Fulton Schools of, of Engineering, Honeywell, as well as Dream Soars Incorporated. I'm happy to have our guest speakers with us today. Shasta Ways was born in a refugee camp and her family traveled from Afghanistan to America in 1987 to escape the Soviet-Afghan war. One of six sisters, Ways and her sisters grew up in Richmond, California. After a long journey of pursuing an education in a non-traditional field, Shasta became the first certified civilian female pilot from Afghanistan and the first person in her family to earn a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, both from Emory Riddle Aeronautical University. Please help me in welcoming Shasta Ways. All right, good afternoon. How is everyone? Let's try that again. How is everyone? Arizona State University? Much better. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to be here today and talk to you all about a very special flight uh, that is going to be coming up in the springtime. And thank you, Honeywell, for giving me this, this opportunity to connect with the Arizo Arizona State University students. Um, and before I get started with my presentation, I'd like to share with you a quick video with you, um, if, if you all don't mind. I hope you all enjoyed that video. I figured uh, capturing everything that Dream Soar and this flight is about in one video would be very interactive and kind of wake you all up after lunchtime. Uh, so I'm Shasta Ways. I'm uh, the founder and president of Dream Soar Incorporated, and I'm here today to kind of share with you a little bit about the Dream Soar flight, um, a little bit about me, my background, the organization, and what we hope to do around the world come spring of next year. So kind of uh, before I jump into the details, there's a big challenge out there. And I know, uh, just a raise of hands, who in here is studying um, aviation or wants to be in aviation as a career? OK, very cool. Who, how many of you are pilots? Very cool. How many of you are studying STEM? I mean, I, I know that this is the campus for that, but I'm, I take it everyone here is studying STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math? Maybe? All right, cool. Sounds good. Um, so you may or may not be familiar with some of the challenges that this um, aviation industry is facing along with STEM. And really, aviation is a big part of STEM. Uh, it's not just the pilot and the mechanical aspect of it. It's the engineers. It's the uh, manufacturing companies building these engines and so on that's sustaining this industry. Um, I started off, excuse me, as a pilot. And I thought, well, as long as I can keep the airplane going forward um, and, and just flying, I really don't need to be great at anything else. And sure enough, I found out that this whole pilot career of mine took me to so many different, um, just kind of motivated me to be good at a lot of different skill sets that you wouldn't necessarily need as a pilot. Uh, for one being marketing. Um, when Dream Store first started off, I was kind of the marketing person. I was the uh, building partnership person. I was the spokesperson. I put on all these different hats and I didn't expect it uh, going into college and, and wanting to study aviation. Um, but back to the challenge, there's about 6% of general aviation pilots in the US who are women, 6%. Um, and this is in the U.S., considering that in the United States, aviation is far more ahead, especially for women. Um, and, and of that population, only 6% are women. Um, there are only 0.6% airline pilots worldwide who are women. That's not even a 1%. It's a 0.6% of women worldwide are, are uh, airline pilots. Even sadder than that figure, only 450 airline captains are women. Um, and this is enough to fit in an Airbus A380 aircraft. There's only 450 around the world who are women. And finally, only 24% of US STEM professionals are women. 
um, and STEM is, is huge. I'm sure as all you, of you know here um, with, with you all studying in the STEM industry. Uh, moving on with a couple of other statistics, uh, just looking from a global perspective. In the UK, 9% of the engineers, engineering workforce are women. Um, and again, UK is probably a little better off with uh, women studying and only 9% of their engineers are women. Just 28% of the world's researchers around the world are women. So there, again, there's a lot of talent out there um, that are not attracted to the STEM, aviation, and research industry. There's a total of 128,807 international female student, students studying STEM. And that figure uh, within the years have not really changed. And then finally, some key reasons for why girls in Singapore feel that they're not good enough for STEM jobs is that they perceive that it's difficult for females to be successful in STEM careers. About 30% felt that way. And 19% felt that the perception, that there was a perception of gender bias. So there's these challenges around the world. And uh, growing up, being from Afghanistan, growing up in a household um, with five sisters, with me, it's six girls, so uh, a family of six daughters, I kind of, came face to face with some of these challenges, some of these, you can't do it, you shouldn't do it, um, we can't afford to do it. Uh, these challenges were presented to me and it, it made me really believe that I couldn't do it. Um, and I'll kind of get into an introduction of me too. Um, so with these challenges in mind, I thought to myself, when I grow up, I'm gonna do something about this. I want to go out there and tell little girls and boys that they are capable of achieving their most wildest dreams. Because I was tired of hearing that I couldn't, that I shouldn't do what I wanted to do in life. So I started this organization called DreamStore Incorporated. Uh, and it was definitely not, I woke up one morning, brushed my hair, and I thought, hey, I want to start a nonprofit organization. It was a very challenging road to getting here. Um, and one thing that I kind of share with everyone is, earlier this year, I thought that this trip, the road to, to getting ready to fly around the world, it was paved. I thought, I had the, this perception that it was paved, and you know, we had all these great sponsors come on board and support this trip, and then halfway into the trip, one of our biggest partners backed out for uh, personal organizational reasons and then it kind of took me off guard. Uh, and then later I came to find out that that kind of um, forced us to be independent, to be strong. Um, and from there we became incorporated as a nonprofit. And now we are serious about us wanting to inspire the next generation. And no one's gonna get in the way of that. No, no political, no politics, no nothing. That's what our goal is. That's what we're telling people we want to do. And that's exactly what we hope to do uh, come spring of 2017. So DreamSort, our mission is to inspire the next generation of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, along with aviation professionals. And how we hope to do this is to host outreach events along the route, which um, I think is the next slide if you want to along the route, and uh, we're doing this through a partnership with ICAO. Anyone familiar with ICAO? Okay, one person maybe. The International Civil Aviation Organization. ICAO is kind of like the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration of the world. Um, so they're kind of the governing body um, that, that puts the regulations and bilateral agreements and all of that for aviation as a whole. Um, so that's how Emirates is able to fly into the U.S. and vice versa. Uh, whoever, the, the organization that regulates all of that is ICAO. And ICAO falls under the umbrella of the United Nations. So for those of you who want to become pilots, especially commercial or airline pilots, and even maybe someday fly around the world, you're going to become very familiar with ICAO. But ICAO <coughs> has, has partnered with us. Um, and hosting events around the world. And what's so unique is that every stop is very different. 
um, one thing going into the planning of these, of these stops is that we knew not one country is the same. Every country is very different. You have different cultures, different religions, um, different way of thinking, that these outreach events were gonna be very different. And right now we're in the planning stages where in England, the Royal Aeronautical Society is, is gonna be hosting me when I, when I get into England and they have all these events lined up. They want me to go out to and speak to a university about Dream Store, whereas in England, we are, thank you, Whereas in, in Spain, for example, we're having uh, everyone really kind of come to the airport uh, in, in um, Madrid and host events at the airport. So every stop is very different. And I also have the opportunity to go to Afghanistan, uh, which I'm going to be hosted by the United Nations there and uh, do some events in Afghanistan. So I don't know how well you could see the route. But I'm starting off in Daytona Beach, Florida, taking off from Shelter Aviation. For those of you who are pilots, you might be familiar with that FBO. And if you guys are in town for whatever reason, um, you, everyone is welcome to, to come and participate in any of these events. And if you go to our website, you can kind of keep up with uh, different events that are going on around the world. It'll be published on social media. And, we encourage you to come and, and participate if you can. My first stop is Columbus, Ohio. So anyone here have any mentors in life? Very cool. Who is your mentor, if you don't mind me asking? One of my mentors is Eliza Echeverria. She is the uh, city planner for the city of Riverside in California. Um, I met her through Women in Transportation Seminar. Cool, and would you say your mentor has been great with you so far, giving you advice? Um, anyone else in here had mentors, I'm sure? All of a sudden, no one wants to raise their hand because they're afraid the mic's going to get to them. Uh, no problem. So one of my mentors, and this was mentioned in the video, and this was kind of a, a shot in the dark. So I was in college. I was broke. I found out that the first woman who ever flew around the world, Jerry Mock, lived three hours away from me. And I thought to myself, I have to find a way to meet her. So I called up her house. I got her phone number through uh, this guy that I met at an airport. I landed, we started talking, and he started to tell me about Jerry Mock and how she was local in Florida. And I just had this feeling, I have to go and meet this woman. She flew around the world in 1964 in a Cessna 180, an era where GPS didn't exist. And this woman flew around the world in a dress. I mean, it's impressive that she flew around the world, but I can't wear a dress for longer than a couple hours. And I'm looking at her thinking she flew around the world in a dress, but she did this and she was constantly doubted. A lot of men at that time kind of looked at her and said, oh, hey, babe, you should just stay in the kitchen, you know, take care of your kids. And she just had this, this attitude about her that it was like, no, I'm going to do this. And no man or woman's going to tell me that I can't. So I, I wanted to meet her. Again, I was broke. So I sold one of my favorite winter coats. I mean, why do I have a winter coat in Florida? You know, it's kind of what I asked myself when I looked at what I could sell to get myself to go meet Jerry. I sold one of my winter coats, uh, got the money, got in a car, drove to from Daytona Beach, Florida to Quincy, Florida, which was about a two and a half hour drive. And I walk up to her house, I ring the doorbell, and this short woman who's maybe five, maybe four nine, five foot feet, feet tall, she opens the door and she's like, hi, I'm Jerry Mock. And I look at her, I'm like, of course I know who you are. Uh, and I met her and I told her my plans of wanting to fly around the world. And I was really, really nervous because she really, just reading about her and, and what she did was just such an inspiration. She invites me to her living room and uh, she started to tell me some general information about her trip, about her stops. And, uh, and then I kind of just started to come up with questions randomly asking her just to get to know her better. So I said, so Jerry, after you flew around the world, what did you do afterwards? And she said, well, I went to Afghanistan. 
And I, my, my mouth drops, and I'm like, what? You went to Afghanistan? Is this a joke? And she said, no. She, one of her stops was Pakistan, and uh, she had this calling to go to Afghanistan. But the performance of her aircraft didn't allow her to fly into such a high-density altitude airport. And uh, she said, after the trip, I had two weeks to rest, and I got in a plane, a commercial plane, and went to Afghanistan. And I told her, Jerry, do you know that I'm originally from Afghanistan? And uh, did you think 50 years later, a woman from Afghanistan would be knocking on your door saying she wants to fly around the world? And naturally, she kind of wanted to be like, I never thought that, not even in a million years. But she smiled, and she said that she would hope someone from Afghanistan would do that. Uh, so from there, Jerry and I, we connected, we bonded. She served as a great mentor to me. I'd call her, and she's like, Shasta, I was talking to uh, one of my, my guys who fuels up my airplane, and I was telling him about what you're doing. He thinks it's so cool. It just, I was so humbled by how she, here she was. She flew around the world, and she just would find ways to empower me. Um, unfortunately, Jerry passed away. And uh, what was very unique was I had the opportunity to fly in a Cessna 180 that was a mock-up of her plane um, across the Atlantic Ocean and spread her ashes. So her family allowed me to be a part of that uh, just because she spoke of me often. And uh, another thing that she told me too is she said, when you go to these stops, take a postcard and write to me. Uh, and send it. And so I do plan on doing that and sending those postcards to her family, uh, just thanking them for an incredible grandmother and mother that they had. But that was my mentor. And I'm very blessed to have had that experience um, that a lot of people I don't think ever get to happen. But part of why I'm sharing all this to you is that as you all are preparing for your college careers and getting ready for the future, be careful and take notes, and kind of be observant. Because these things were happening, and it kind of led me to this idea of flying around the world and starting a nonprofit and, and so on. Even years ago, five years ago, some of the people that I met at these random conferences now are the ones who are able to connect me with some of our key partners. You, you're gonna meet people, and you're gonna think to yourself, you know, it's a really nice guy. I, probably will have nothing to do in the future with um, the UAE. But he's great. It's a great contact. And then maybe in a few years from now, you'll find out that that contact is going to be a great resource for whatever you're planning on doing. So that's just some, some advice for you guys. But going back to the route, uh, Columbus, Ohio is a very big stop, very um, special to me because that's where Jerry took off. That's where some of her family uh, currently lives, and we're going to have a big kickoff with the Ohio State University there. Then over to Montreal, Canada. That's where IKEA is based out of. St. John's, Canada. I know for those of you who are pilots, you're like, wait a minute, St. John's, Canada to the Azores? Uh, especially if you know the aircraft that I'm flying, I'll show it to you in a, in a second. But it's, it's a Beechcraft Bonanza. Um, so Portugal... The Azores, Madrid, uh, England, Rome, Spain, uh, Egypt, the UAE, India. So I'll, be, I'll have two stops in India. Um, I will be going to Afghanistan, but not in the Bonanza. Insurance has been uh, an interesting part of this planning um, process. And, and it's very difficult to get insurance for a trip around the world. Everyone who kind of looked at the application were like, what? What are you doing? You want to fly around the world? Uh, but luckily, Global Aerospace, um, they're based out of Dallas. They're the ones who are doing our insurance for the trip. We had a lot of discussions about Afghanistan, and um, having the airplane go into Kabul is going to be a big challenge, not, even, not only security-wise, but um, a lot of the planes that fly lower altitudes sometimes get shot at. Um, so we want to avoid any sort of um, just 
anything, a risk, anything at all involving risk, we just want to mitigate or really assess. So I had to make the decision that I'm going to leave the airplane in the UAE and uh, fly on a commercial airliner to Afghanistan, do the events, and then go back. Um, and at least I'm going to Afghanistan. It's all right. Uh, but, but security and safety is priority here. Um, we don't, I don't want to do anything that's going to jeopardize um, the future of DreamStore or the flight in itself. So after Afghanistan, it's Thailand, Singapore, Australia, uh, Fiji, some of the South Pacific Islands, um, American Samoa, Hawaii. When I get to Hawaii, the, the aircraft will be down for maintenance for about a week. Uh, we're gonna, one of the mechanic guys, who is you, usually familiar with ferry flights, he's gonna do a thorough inspection to make sure uh, the aircraft is sound. And then from there, uh, for those of you who are pilots, wind is everything, weather is everything. Um, this trip could take possibly 14, 15 hours long. Um, so I wanna make sure that the weather is is, is, if not perfect, uh, for this leg of the flight. Coming back to San Diego, um, I'll be landing in San Diego, California. Um, from there, it's Phoenix, Arizona, so I'll be back here again. Um, and if you all are in the area, please come by and see the aircraft. Uh, then from there, it's Wichita, Kansas, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Cincinnati, Ohio, Washington, D.C., Signature Flight Support, is um, allowing me to, to fly into their uh, FBO, and, and uh, there's going to be several NBAAs going to be there, the National Business Aviation Association. We may possibly get um, some high visibility politicians to come to the event just to kind of uh, say hello. I'm not into politics, so that's not really the exciting part for me. The exciting part is the kids that we're going to get to meet, but it's going to be kind of a very Washington, D.C.-like stop with um, all that's involved in that area. And then from there, it's uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Mobile, Alabama, and then back to Daytona Beach, Florida. So that's the route that's going to take me, make me circle the globe. Uh, and next slide. Our main mission is to provide in addition to inspiring the next generation, global scholarship opportunities. Uh, so these two young girls you see in the picture, I had the chance to sit right seat in a Hawker 400. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with airplanes, it's a jet. Um, and I had the chance to fly all over Russia and Asia. And when, I, when we got to Indonesia, I met these two young girls um, that were just so inspired by aviation. They had just the the biggest smiles on their faces, and they couldn't believe that I was a pilot. It blew their mind away. And I, I could just see the excitement in their eyes. They were both very passionate about it, and I felt very guilty that here I am, I'm able to fly in these remote parts of the world, and these young girls can't even sit in an airplane um, because those opportunities don't exist for young girls in Indonesia. And it was that moment that I realized Scholarships are very, very important. And I knew this going on into my, my flight training, that scholarships is key. But providing global scholarships is, is one of our main objectives to young girls to go and pursue STEM and aviation in their own country um, because we have a bigger picture to look at. Yes, there is a need in the US. There's a need. Um, but there's also a need all over the world. And aviation and STEM is global. Um, and we need to start thinking about how we're going to sustain it globally so we can all enjoy these amazing fields. So that's one of our bigger objectives in, in the Stream Store initiative as well. Um, next slide. So I think you all kind of know about me a little bit. Um, born in a, a refugee camp in Afghanistan, that picture you see on the bottom is with my dad and I, when we first got to America. English is actually my third language. I grew up, didn't really know how to speak English, actually. It's, uh, it's interesting. And I took ESL, English Second Language Courses, my whole life. Um, I didn't read my first chapter book until I was in the 10th grade. Uh, I found myself with this idea that I was going to get married at a young age, 
and have a big family kind of like what my mom did and generations before her. And I remember one day I was at lunchtime, it was lunchtime in high school and I was sitting, it was a group of my friends and they were all talking about college. And I kind of sunk in my seat and I thought to myself, I don't think college is for me. I mean, I didn't really have a lot to contribute. And in high school, college is kind of life. Like, if you are not going to college, then your your friends are probably a different crowd. Or it, it's just, every, that's what everyone's mind is on, which is a great thing. And I definitely wanted to feel accepted and a part of my friends. But more importantly, I thought to myself, you know, it might be too late for me, given the fact that I hadn't even read a chapter book when I was in the ninth grade. And I thought, well, I have five sisters. If it's too late for me to go to college, at least I can figure what college is all about, what the SATs are all about, figure out financial aid options, the uh, college application process, and share that with my sisters. So I, in high school, I started the College Bound Club. Um, and I thought, gosh, I'm getting all these resources I might as well start a club where I can share this with other students. A lot of them were foreign or my classmates from ESL who, uh, whose parents were new to the US and uh, just kind of as a group, we, we tried to figure out this whole college equation. Um, from there, I kind of started to tutor my sisters and make sure that they read and they uh, took school seriously. And then from graduating from high school, um, this was kind of a surprise. There's a, a scholarship that my high school awards to one college student who uh, they wanted to invest in, give a scholarship, and have them go on and, and pursue college or further education. And I just thought, hey, why not? Let me just put in my application. Maybe I'll get it, maybe I won't, but at least I tried. And sure enough, I was the recipient of that scholarship, which was very empowering. I thought, hey, if someone's gonna give me money to go study, it just, it was a very empowering emotion and feeling. And so, what I often tell people is that I came to this country not knowing a lot about America, thinking I was gonna get married at a young age, and I had no intentions of going to school. And here I am now, a pilot, working on my second master's degree, the founder of a nonprofit, and I'm getting ready to fly around the world. If I can do this, there's no way, no reason why you all cannot do whatever your most craziest, wildest, amazing dreams are. And I know this sounds very, I call it like Disney World, like, you know, dreams come true, and they do. And everyone has different paths in life. Some of these paths are gonna be challenging. It's gonna be hard. I know a lot of you in here are college students and you're kind of getting ready to go into the real world. The real world is, is tough. It requires a lot of work. Um, you are going to challenge yourself in different ways. You're gonna come across a lot of unfair situations, but it's all to shape you for the person that you will become for the great things that you will do. Um, so. Nowadays, rather than looking at a problem or a challenge, I don't think, dang it, why does this have to happen to me? I look at it like, bring it on. If I, if, if I was able to get over some of the hurdles and challenges in my life, this should be nothing. Um, so I hope that's some word of wisdom for you all. But if I can do it, there's no reason why anyone can't do it. Uh, and that's usually what I, I kind of share with everyone. And a side fact, I grew up deathly afraid of flying. <laughs> I know, it's just so bizarre. Like every time I, I talk about myself and to aviation folks, they're like, what, who are you? You're afraid of, yeah, I grew up terrified of flying. Um, and in the video, it talked about how uh, I had my chance to go fly on a commercial flight and that whole experience was life-changing. Um, I didn't know sitting on the back of a Delta 757 Boeing 757 aircraft could change my life in ways that was not, it, it just, it, it steered my life into this direction where I'm here speaking to you all today. Um, so I often tell people sometimes your biggest fears in life can be your biggest passions and you won't know unless you face them. So moving on to the next slide. 
This is the aircraft that I'll be flying around the world. It's a Beechcraft Bonanza. Uh, the aircraft is based in Daytona Beach, Florida. Uh, and we were recently at the National Business Aviation Association in Orlando, Florida, where the aircraft was featured. And uh, it's currently going through an oil change right now. Um, but it's a beach bonanza. You have the DeShannon tip tanks, which holds about 20 gallons of fuel. Um, and with me, I have a co-pilot and passengers that I'd like to introduce you to. Fuel tanks. <laughs> so my co-pilot is a fuel tank, and my passengers behind me are fuel tanks. Um, so yeah, it's a flying fuel tank. <laughs> uh, but the Beechcraft Bonanza is a very capable airplane. And I actually wrote my, my first master's degree's thesis on flying a single-engine, piston-powered aircraft around the world. Uh, and it's the Continental IO550 engine is just very, very dependable. Um, this is a, an airplane that's actually flown around the world quite often. Um, and the tanks in the back, uh, they are what's going to get me around the world. In total, I'm going to have about 300 gallons of avgas on board. That's with the mains and the tip tanks and the additional fuel. Now, I won't be flying with 300 gallons every trip of the, the flight, but most certainly um, for the trip from Hawaii to, to San Diego. Uh, I, I actually had this past summer, I flew this entire summer in, in um, San Diego, California, out of Gillespie Field. And I did some very interesting flight training. Um, just to give you an example, we didn't have the tanks back then, but we opened the back of the airplane and put boxes of oil in the back to kind of simulate the overgross, overweight uh, scenario. And we are flying at an airport, Mammoth. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that uh, airport, but it's an upslope airport. And as soon as you take off, you have a big mountain in front of you. Uh, so, so flying the airplane, and the density altitude was about 9,500 feet. So it was very interesting to fly this plane in this situation where it, it no longer, it's not what I'm used to. The plane is just very, very uh, difficult to fly. It, it's not as responsive. It's not as reactive. And I know if I bank too quickly to avoid the mountain, that I'm going to stall and crash the airplane. So it was a very interesting learning experience. And really, the airplane is the best classroom for, for pilots to kind of gain this real life uh, scenario and, and flight profile. And I got to do training um, in California, flew a couple of interesting legs. But it, it's, all, it's made me much more confident as a pilot uh, flying the airplane overgross the way that it was. But yeah, so these are my, uh, my passengers on board. And this picture actually was taken uh, when I was flying from San Diego, San Diego, California to Austin. Um, I took this picture and I was able to upload it to social media thanks to Honeywell's The Airwave System uh, by Bendix King. And this system is so cool. It, it allows me to have internet even across oceans. As I'm flying the Pacific Ocean, I can check my weather. I can connect with my mom, who I'm sure is not going to ever sleep during the duration of this trip. Um, and I can connect with her and tell her that I'm all right. I can connect with my team. So really, this system that, Aero that Honeywell and Bendix King has created called the Airwave is going to make me feel like I'm not doing this trip solo. So in a way, I feel like I'm cheating compared to what Jerry did flying around the world, um, but our mission is to inspire the next generation. It's not for me to fly around the world and prove to anyone about um, anything. So, but yeah, that's the cool thing. And, and really, even the fact that I'm here able to speak with you all, it's thanks to Honeywell. Uh, and they've been just such an incredible partner to work with. And they really, truly believe in what we're doing, and that's in inspiring the next generation. It's very refreshing to uh, partner with a company that is not just saying that they're going to do something, they're actually doing something about it. Uh, but more importantly, it's so cool that I can tweet to you guys, Instagram, 
Facebook pictures, as a, just with progress reports along the way, which makes it even that much more cool to, to do this trip uh, under these circumstances. These are some of our partners. Um, ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Authority, Women in Corporate Aviation, Goodyear, Jeppesen, uh, it's kind of all listed up there. Global Aerospace is doing our insurance. GSSI has come on board uh, to help with the maintenance aspect of it. Jackson Walker is our legal counsel. A lot of these folks are doing this, um, a lot of pro bono work, a lot of uh, assistance, whether it's financially or with the outreach events. And I, I have to share this with everyone, is that it wasn't easy to get this list to get these incredible people in the industry involved. Um, and it took, it took me at least maybe three and a half years to get to this point um, of just me going out to these events and sharing this vision that I had for this flight. And then I wanna say about a year and a half to two years ago, it became more serious and we started to get some of our bigger, bigger sponsors. Um, but this is by no means was this an overnight thing. It was a lot of hard work a lot of sacrifice, and people just honestly, they were like, wow, you're very persistent. You are not giving up. Um, you're going to do this, and you've come to me for the past couple of years. You know, we, we want to help you, but above all, when you are just honest with people and you have a passion, people can read that, um, and we're, Dream Store is very serious about what we say we're gonna do. Next slide. So that's pretty much all that I have. Uh, thank you all for kind of zoning in and listening. Um, with you all being students, I encourage you, if you want to get involved with Dream Soar, um, in the video you saw the Dream Team, uh, students, graduate and undergraduate students who are, they're doing everything. They're doing marketing, they're doing flight planning, uh, and we kind of pair them up with our advisory council members and, and make sure that they're on the right path. But um, I am an Embry-Riddle graduate, but I, there's a bigger picture here. There's the aviation industry, there's the STEM industry that we have to all think about. Um, and I love airplanes just as much as you all love airplanes and aerospace and rocket ships. Um, so we, this is a group effort. It's, it's really a global initiative. Um, so I don't want you to think, oh, she's an Embry-Riddle grad. Can't talk to her, she's you know this or that. Uh, it, it, you got to look at the bigger picture. But with that said, we have students from the Ohio State participating. We have students from Western Michigan University participating. So if you all are interested in getting involved, please, please come talk to me. You can visit us at dreamstore.org or you can um, follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. And uh, I'll be around if you have any questions. Thank you for your time. <laughs>